We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Bree Guzman, and I am the Youth Prevention Manager, and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in just a little bit. But welcome to today's internet safety presentation where we talk about technology and just how, how to balance that technology to connect, how to have a be better balance in youth lives when it comes to technology. I am with Not My Kid as well. Um, our mission statement at Not My Kid is to ensure every kid thrives by inspiring positive life choices. And our commitment is to offer the best in prevention and behavioral health to protect youth mental health and to leverage the power of lived experience. We make a difference by educating to build resiliency, inspiring hope for the future, and to grow connection and communication. At Not My Kid, when it comes to prevention, we go upstream for that true prevention. So simply put, if you can imagine a river and imagine people keep falling into this river, we are not gonna wait at the bottom to catch people who have fallen in. We're gonna go upstream with solutions to the site where people keep falling in to try and prevent more people from unexpectedly swimming. And I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, thank you, Allison, for putting that in the chat. I forgot to mention at the beginning that if you do have any questions during this presentation, go ahead and drop those in the chat box, or you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. I do have two moderators online with me today. I have Allison and Erica. So should you be experiencing any issues or have any questions, they will be able to answer them, or I can answer them at the end. Safety first, we'd like to just include a few reminders before going into the content of our presentations because some of this can be sensitive material. Um, so during our presentations, we like to practice radical presence. We like to take space and make space. We like to focus on self-care and collective care and to know that there's gonna be resources available at the end after all the content we go through. And at the end of it all, what's said here stays here and what's learned here leaves here, especially if we are sharing vulnerable stories or if someone in the chat shares an experience of theirs that relates to this presentation, we're gonna leave that sensitive information here, but we're gonna take what's learned and share it with others. As I said at the beginning, I am the Youth Prevention Manager. I am a program facilitator. I've done lots of professional training and I am a dog mom. I am also the oldest of four siblings. And so I take pride in being the oldest. That is one of the, that's my favorite hat that I wear. And so being a mentor to youth, working with youth has, has always been a passion of mine. And so I take from what I have learned as a youth prevention specialist prior, and I bring it to adult programs because being out in the field, you get to hear firsthand what youth are going through, the things they're getting into and how they feel about it and what they're wanting. Our prevention education programs are research-based. So here are some of the places we receive our information. And we're gonna go ahead and dive right into it. We're gonna be looking at the current tech life landscape. We're gonna be looking at systems, devices, and threats. We're gonna identify risk factors and signs of an imbalance. We're gonna learn strategies to build resiliency and use. And we're going to feel ready to respond to a youth in need when it comes to internet safety. All right, understanding the current tech life landscape. So teens who say they are online almost constantly has doubled from 24% to 46% since 2017. I just kind of want to paint the picture of what teens were doing online back in 2014. Did I say 2016? Um, back in 2014. So 10 years ago, what were youth doing online? Um, Instagram was was around, it had, I think, come around maybe three years before that, so maybe 2011. However, in 2014, it was getting more popular, but it wasn't so much a public space. It was very much a private space where youth only followed their friends, so they maybe only had anywhere from 100 followers to 100 following. Um, and Snapchat was starting to come around as well, still very much a private space. You couldn't see celebrity stories or you couldn't, they didn't have snap maps, which if you don't know, we can talk about it in a couple of slides. Um, they had YouTube. They had this messaging app called Kick. They had Vine, which is like old TikTok. And they had video games. But when it came to video games, it was mostly console games, like on the PlayStation um, or the Xbox, not a lot of mobile games. So that was 10 years ago. So what has changed now in some of these spaces? 
One, Instagram is very much a public space now. Youth are following whoever, and pe including people they don't know, influencers, um, friends of friends. And now people are promoting their business on Instagram. So it's very much a public space. It's no longer this private, intimate space. TikTok is now one of the most popular apps. It is very public, not so private. YouTube, YouTube has YouTube has always been popular. There's, there's more features, features to YouTube now, and people are becoming more interested in becoming um, streamers or influencers. So a lot of people are going to that space to find a, a career. Snapchat is very public now. And then video games. Now youth can play video games on their phones, and they can also play it with whoever, with strangers. It's very much an online public space that has that has influenced the change from youth from the low percentage of youth being online constantly to it having been doubled. And then I also want to say that youth are also taking school online or they're doing school assignments online and they're also streaming a lot of things online when it comes to movies or shows. Um, Netflix back in the day, you would have a DVD delivered to your house, but now um, you can watch it from the comfort of your of your couch, you can watch it on the go on your phone. And then there's many more apps like Hulu, Peacock, Amazon Prime. So a lot of things are taking place online. When it comes to access, 95% of teens have access to smartphones. Back in 2014, it was about 73%, and now it's up to 95%. 90% of youth have access to computers, and 80% have access to gaming consoles. So these are all the different ways that a youth can access the internet. And a lot of them do have that access. When it comes to screen time, the average person spends seven hours online daily. Now it's not broken down to whether it's social media use or for school or for work, but on average, a person spends seven hours online daily doing whatever they do online. So screen time is a part of our life. I look at a screen for up to five to, seven hours a day for work. So screen time is a part of my life. And it's also part of my life when I'm not working because I do also watch things. You know, I like to watch my TV, watch my movies. So same goes for youth. Um, screen time is no longer something that we can remove entirely because we do so much online, whether we're researching or, or shopping or looking up useful information. It's here to stay. Not all screen time is equal, however. Screen time itself is not implicitly bad. So everyone uses their phones to connect with their friends and family. Everyone uses their phone to look up helpful information. So that type of screen time is not that bad, but are youth using screen time to, are youth, sorry, are youth on their phones looking at social media things that are making them feel bad? Are youth on their phones placing bets on these, um online casino games are they placing sports bets when they don't really have when they don't have the money to do that in the first place um or are they facetiming their cousins or are they learning a new skill from youtube so we can't say all screen time is bad there's definitely things that we depend on when it comes to technology that are helpful to us and there's also a lot of things that aren't that helpful to us especially for teenagers so we're going to go ahead and look into those things I do want to spend just a little bit of time, not too much time, talking about common apps. Um, so we have a bunch of images here on the screen. Maybe you're not familiar with them all. So I will go from left to right just real quick to throw out some names. So we have Reddit, starting with the little robot looking man. Then we have WhatsApp, the green bubble with the phone, Snapchat, Discord, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, X. TikTok, Be Real, and Laugh. So a lot of us are familiar with some of these apps, maybe not all of them. And maybe the last two you don't know notice, Be Real and Laugh. Those are the newest social media apps to come out. Um, they're not as popular as Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, but they're here and I think they're here to stay for a little bit. I think what's most important is to familiarize ourselves with just the common features of them all that make them dangerous or um, a threat to teen safety. So just think about what you what do you know about these apps already and think about how can they be dangerous. So 
when it comes to all these apps, things they have in common is youth can disclose personal information and location on every single one of these apps. They can disclose their location and personal information that is a threat to their safety because that means anyone else who's using these apps can get that information. Um, they can be exposed to mature content on any of these apps and they could engage with predators on any of these apps. So there are so many other apps that are in the Google store or the Apple store. I'll just throw a number out there because I, I thought it was shocking when I found out there are three million and there are three and a half million apps in the Google store. And there are two million apps in the Apple store. And the reason why I'm focusing on these ones is because these ones are the most commonly used ones by people of, of all ages, including youth. Um, and the other ones, they have a lifespan, I think, of anywhere from 30 days, 30 to 90 days, and then they get deleted. These are the ones that usually tend to stay. But with any new app that comes out, it's important to be thinking about how youth might engage with predators, how they may be exposed to mature content, and how the privacy settings they choose to select or not select can um, lead to them disclosing personal info, such as their location. So that's about all, not all we have to see on apps, but apps are gonna come and go and youth are gonna be excited about new ones and they're gonna drop them because there's not that many people using them. At the end of the day, youth want to be where a lot of other people are and that's these ones we see here. So just make sure you're having conversations with the youth about the apps they're using. Make sure, you know, prior to them getting a smartphone or if they have a smartphone right now and maybe they're not allowed to have social media, before they do get access to social media or you grant them, let talk to them about what apps they're interested in, let them know which apps you're concerned about. I would download the app yourself and become familiar with it. That way, um, you know what your youth is using. All right, the next section, we're gonna take a look at systems, devices, and threats. And we're gonna start off by talking about artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence, AKA AI, has been around for quite some time. It is actually present every day in our life. From managing our email inbox to asking Siri where the nearest cafe is, um, or to listening to playlists that Spotify recommends for you or Spotify makes for you. That is AI showing up every day in your life. And so it's not a new thing, but I think there is a lot of buzz around AI right now, or we know there's a lot of buzz around AI right now because of things like chat, D, chat GT. GPT, so sorry. Um, but there's also another thing that's happening right now that is causing a lot of buzz around AI and they're called deep fakes. If you don't know what a deep fake is, a deep fake is a fake image, video, or audio created by using existing content that has been altered and manipulated with the intent to craft a fictional scenario. So basically people are taking an original image or original audio, and they're making either different images or videos with it, or even like sound bites with it to most of the time to create a fake scenario um, with the intent to either harm that person or to gain something. So a lot of scammers are using deep fakes um, to attempt fraud, to make fraud attempts. And when deep fakes were first coming around, it was either like an altered image or maybe, uh, you know, a video that was okay. It wasn't the greatest, but now what they're able to do with all the deep fake technology that's out there, they're, la they're also able to clone someone's voice almost perfectly. They can take a sound bite from a video that has been posted online and they could make that voice say whatever they want. So imagine that now being attached to a video that looks almost realistic. There are a couple of things you could look out for to, to tell if the video is a deep fake or not. And um, you can go ahead and Google search these things, but it's sometimes it's like different different shades of, of skin tone when it comes to like the face and the neck or like some areas are super duper blurred out and some are really, really defined. There's a whole little list that you can, and I recommend doing them because or looking that up. Because a lot of time when I'm scrolling on my feed, there's a lot of um, deep fake news that comes out. Anywho, but yeah, imagine someone being able to manipulate your voice to say whatever they want. And imagine 
someone using your voice to call a family member of yours to ask for money because you're in a pickle. And your family member is most likely going to believe you and probably will send you the money. Um, but there's a lot of questions that can be asked to prevent people who are trying to trying to attempt those things. But just know that it's possible. Just know that it's possible that you could get a phone call from someone you think you know asking for money or um, asking for a favor or anything like that. What it what used to happen was my family used to get um, phone call, fake phone calls from family members in Mexico saying, hey, so-and-so has, has got our cousin. Um, they need this amount of money or else, you know, we're not going to see them again. Really, really scary, really, really dramatic. And it, they used to have to be super dramatic to try to convince, but now they don't have to be dramatic. Now it can be fairly simple because you have that, that voice that you're familiar with. Um, really advanced stuff, really scary stuff too. And it goes just beyond politicians and celebrities because a lot of politicians and celebrities are having their content manipulated um, either for political gain or to ruin their reputation, whatever. But it's not just a problem for, for those kind of people. It's a problem for everyone, including teenagers. Um, so deep fake porn is something that we should all be aware of and we should all be aware that it can happen to, to anyone. There is a case going on right now because a high schooler, it was a high school female student whose photos were taken and they were manipulated by deep fake technology and turned into pornographic images. And so they're trying really hard to get those images off the internet. And there are sites, there are websites and resources that help with that, taking down um, pornographic images or altered images, um, things like that. But it is a real, it is a problem for real people, for real everyday people who maybe don't even have that big, that much of a presence online, but it can just take that one person for whatever reason they intend to um, harm you or ruin your reputation or something like that. Whatever that motive is, it just takes for one person to have a bad motive to alter an image of you um, to cause chaos and cause real damage and problems for someone that you know, they never just expected to go through something like this. So all that to say, when it comes to deep fake pornography and teens, it it is a global issue and we should be concerned about the powerful deep fake technology that's out there. And more of a reason why we want to let our teens know that we should try to keep as much of our social media accounts as private as possible. And if we are going to have a public account, why do we want it public and what are we sharing? If it's like their business page, if it's a page where they're expressing their art or they want to show off their art, that's fine. But maybe when it's, when it is related to themselves, their personal life, we should always encourage them to go private. Not saying that would prevent this entirely, but it would help. All right. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat for the QA. Now we're gonna talk about video games because we can't talk about technology without talking about video games. 90% of American teenagers play video games. And on average, people spend about seven hours and seven minutes a week playing video games. So video games are not just limited to PlayStation or Xbox anymore. You can play them from your computer, your laptop, your cell phone. Um, now we have Nintendo Switch. So video games can be played from a lot of places, but they are different. Video games are different from other screen time in crucial ways. So video games, it's it's all about balance. Youth play video games to connect with their peers or to challenge themselves to try to be different levels, to try and problem solve or like puzzle solve. A lot of video games have like puzzle pieces, puzzle components to them. Um, and it could promote some pro-social behaviors. However, when youth are spending too much time playing video games and neglecting other areas of their life, including their responsibilities, their hygiene, or they're picking up some, some negative behaviors, that's, that's definitely an issue. Um, when used in moderation, when used while still tending to their responsibilities, you know, their hygiene, um, it could be a positive outlet when used in moderation, but when they are used as a constant avoidance, youth also turn to video games to avoid 
stresses in their life, that's when it becomes an issue because I know of some, when I was a teenager, I know of some friends who would play video games for up to five hours in one sitting or four hours in one sitting. That's a lot of time, especially during a weekday or during a school night um, or even on a weekend when, you know, we should be promoting a non-sedentary lifestyle of getting up, maybe spending some time outside, of course, when it's not summertime, um, but not sitting in one place for four hours. We, we never want that. So youth do turn to video games during times of stress. And we want to promote other behaviors, of course, when it gets to that point. So when it comes to areas of concern, when it comes to video games, we want to consider safety. Like I said, the beginning video online gaming is a very much a public space. You can play with whoever from wherever uh, of whatever age. And so you never really know who you're playing against. That, that's why it's important to not give out some sensitive information when you're playing video games. You may think they are a friend, they may talk to you like a friend, but at the end of the day, you don't know who that other person is that you're playing with. So it's always important to have those conversations with youth when they are, when they keep wanting to play with, because they do make friends online. They do make friends with people they play games with. And so as they are getting more comfortable or as they're getting more excited to play with this person over and over again, just make sure you're having those conversations with them. Um, another, when it comes to safety, one thing that was happening and still continues to happen is it's called swatting. I don't know if you heard that before, and it's pretty, it's pretty wild. So swatting happens when, um, a video gamer decides to call the police or a SWAT squad on another video gamer for whatever reason, whether it's to win the game, they want to win the game. So they're going to call the SWAT on this person, whether it's, they think it's funny or they really don't care for the person and maybe don't even get hurt. Um, they will send the police or the SWAT team to this person's house if they know their address. And yeah, and then you have this this law enforcement busting through your door and you know you have to act a certain type of way because they think there is an actual threat. So that was taking place. So we definitely want to Make sure that if youth are talking about these things or if they're thinking that it's funny, if they heard of it happening to someone, we want to have serious conversations about it and how it can be very unsafe, how it's not okay to do. Um, and just always thinking about the other person's safety. Another thing, when it comes to privacy, if your youth is giving out their sensitive information, um, such as their address, location or full name or date of birth or their social media handles. If another player doesn't like them or wants to hurt them in any way, they could dox them, which means they just release that information they know about them to everyone else online. And then they start to get trolled, cyberbullied. And from what we from what we know, cyberbullying is very harmful to mental health. And so doxing is another threat to safety. And that's why we should always keep our inf our information private. And then there is a toxic culture online, especially any anything can be taken to the next level. Any comments can be taken to the next level where it becomes harmful, whether it's around gender, race, ethnicity, uh, sexuality, or religion, or even ability. People always, you know, people like to, to joke, but they can take it too far online, especially when you're playing video games. And so we wanna be aware of the toxic culture um, that takes place online. And we could do that by, listening in on the conversations our youth are having. And we can do that by maybe having them set up their console in the living room, in a public space and not in their room when their bedroom door shut. That way we can tune in and listen to the things they're repeating. Or maybe we encourage our youth to not plug in their headphones and we can kind of hear what the other people are saying. And maybe your youth's not saying it, but if they're exposed to it over a long period of time, it can become normalized, it can become um, desensitized to it, or they can even pick it up. And now they're saying these things. So we want to be on the lookout for that. We want to make sure youth are not neglecting their responsibilities and they're not normalizing some of these um, toxic behaviors or harmful behaviors to other people. And when it comes to the game itself, what are you seeing? Are you seeing over-sexualized characters? Are you seeing mature content? Every game has a mature rate, mature rating. So it might be a good idea to take a look into that before letting your youth purchase a game or before purchasing a game for your youth or before they download it to their phones even. 
Um, there are a lot of mature games in the app store that can be easily downloaded to someone's phone. And in your youth, what are you seeing? Are you seeing any changes when it comes to their hygiene? Is it a decline in hygiene? Are they now not getting any sleep? Are they performing poor at school? And again, neglecting responsibility. So if they are doing these things, then it's definitely time to have a conversation about their tech life balance when it comes to video gaming and the reasons why they're playing the video games. And if it's, you know, a super strong uh, coping, coping mechanism, we wanna know what are they avoiding? What are the things they're avoiding in life and how can we help them solve those? That way they can return and play video games in a healthy way. When it comes to tuning in, we do want to be a look, be on the, on not the lookout. We'll just be on the, not the ear out. <laughs> we want to listen for hate speech, threats, racial slurs, toxic language, bullying, and disclosing of personal info. All this does take place during video um, on online games. So we want to be aware of those. And even, um, not even just for teenagers, even those who are preteens or like even in elementary school, my my, I have a brother who's 10 years old. He got a Nintendo Switch. And I think, I don't think my parents understood uh, how even a 10-year-old look, listening to YouTube can pick up on some of these things. And they might even not even know what they're saying, but they're repeating it. And so then it gets repeated to my brother. Then my brother starts saying it without actually even knowing what it means, such as toxic language. And then um, it's just that easy. It's that easy for like a 10 year old or an eight year old to pick up on these things and and it spread to all their peers. So definitely even for young kids, we want to be aware of these things. Tips to protect, definitely research online, research the games that your youth are playing, understand the age ratings, play the game yourself sometimes, sit down next to them, ask to join in or ask to play, take over for a round and ask questions. What do you like about this game? Why do you, why are you really, why can't you wait to play this game every time we come home? What about this game makes it so hard for you to not play it? Just some questions. All right, now we're gonna talk about gambling and maybe you're thinking, why are we talking about gambling during a youth internet safety presentation? Well, it's an adult one, but we're talk talking about youth behavior. Um, If you didn't know, 10 years old is actually the age gambling disorders can begin to develop in children. So it is very much a youth problem now. 60 to 80% of high school students have already gambled for money. And this is in within the United States. In Arizona, about 54% of youth reported placing a bet or gambling in the last 12 months. With the most commonly reported activity, activity being spending money to access extra features on video games or apps. So when it comes to these youth gambling, motivations are excitement and enjoyment derived from the gambling itself, although boredom, loneliness, competition, escape from daily stressors, and the reduction of anxiety and depression are among other motivators for gambling. So it's not just a monetary gain, it's also um, a a coping mechanism and a way to bring excitement into their lives, escape from boredom, things like that. 5% of youth ages 12 to 17 suffer from problem gambling versus 1% of adults suffer from problem gambling. I thought this one shocked me the most. Uh, problem, problem gambling is gambling behavior that is damaging to a person or their family, often disrupting their daily life. So Children and teens are at higher risk than adults for developing a gambling problem. And if they do start at that young age, it is more likely to develop into a gambling addiction later in life. But why are they more at risk? Why are children and teens more at risk? Um, I'd say one of the strongest factors is there are no federal rules about advertising. So youth are being, ex just as adults are, but youth are being exposed to all these sports betting ads that we are seeing everywhere. And betting on sports is now as easy as tapping an app on your phone. And it does go beyond sports betting. And when it comes to tapping things, it is with the youth still having 
a brain under development, it's so much easier for them to tap without thinking about the risk associated with it or without thinking about the consequence, consequences consequences you associated with it. So it's very it's very easy for you to just tap without without thinking essentially. Um, sometimes, not all the times, right? We like to give them some credit that they do have that ability to stop and think. However, with their brain still being in, in development, it is that much harder. And so it does go beyond sports betting. I know we're seeing a lot of sports betting ads everywhere, but it's also for youth to gamble while gaming. Um, got, online gambling is more accessible now than ever, and games are designed to keep players engaged. So some games include gambling-like features, such as loot boxes, um, microtransactions, and quick chance reward systems. It's that quick chance reward systems that might lead youth to other forms of gambling. So youth who participate in simulated gambling in games are more likely to gamble with real money. So maybe they started off with their games and then it um, transitioned into like sports betting or playing online casino, uh, casino games, which are easily accessible. And the age verification is also as easy as like if youth were trying to buy um, THC products online or like nicotine products online, it's not that hard of a system to, to um, manipulate or fake, what I wanna say, which is a concern. All right, we're gonna talk about mature content now. 12 is the average age when pornography is first consumed. And this is part of the reason why we need to have this conversation. It could get younger and younger as youth are getting smartphones earlier and earlier. Um, we do know that when it comes to um, the access of websites with mature content, there are a lot of free ones, there are a lot of ones where you don't need to enter an age. And so that is why it's so easy for someone as young as 12 to be able to access stuff like that. 59% of youth watched it for a week or more. Those who were exposed to it, who, who have been exposed to it. 46% um, of youth reported that it just popped up. And we we believe this, right? I, I believe this. Of course, maybe not all the time. Maybe sometimes it's their friends that she showed them or maybe they looked for it on purpose. But I've been on some websites where an ad just pop up, whether it's even like a for a mature, mature rated game or a mature rated um, app. I see those a lot. And then sometimes I do see ads for a pornographic site that they want me to visit. Um, and so definitely as a, you know, I know now what a sketchy website looks like versus the not sketchy website. And it's going to be those sketchy websites that are going to have those um those ads that pop up. And so I always, as soon as I see those sketchy ads, I exit out of the website because I don't trust it from that point on. But a youth may not know that. They might not have navigated just the general internet that much beyond their social media apps and their video games to know the difference between a sketchy website and a non-sketchy website. But they're also, these ads are also popped up on other websites as well. Um, so 46%, it just popped up, we believe it. 22% reported that someone else showed it to them. Also, yeah. Um, one of the friends came across it and shared it with them, and now they've been exposed. 57% of teens have not discussed porn with a trusted adult. That's more than half are not having conversation about mature content that is online. And pornography sites receive more website traffic in the United States than Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Netflix, Pinterest, and Zoom combined. So that should also tell us the amount of pornographic content that exists online, because it is a lot. I believe it's more than half of the internet. I, I would say is um, pornographic content from what I've researched. So it's out there. It's only a matter of time before youth are either shown it or just come across it. And then we are gonna talk about the brain development in a couple of slides, but part of their the reason why it is hard for them to either stop watching it or um, wanting to keep back going back to it is because of their brain development. Now we're gonna talk about sextortion. 
Sextortion is a type of sexual abuse that involves the non-consensual sharing of sexual images. So a youth sends an image to someone and then that person turns around and says, all right, if you don't send me this amount of money, if you don't agree to meet up with me, if you don't agree to send me more, I'm going to send this picture to your family. I'm going to send this picture to your friends. I'm going to post this picture of you online. That is sextortion. Sextortion schemes can, uh, can occur online anywhere from social media apps to gaming sites or other or video chat apps and messaging apps as well. Um, from January 2022 to 2023, more than 7,000 online sextortion of minors were reported to the FBI. So in that year, 7,000, and that's not all of them. You know, there are some youth who aren't going to report or who aren't going to share for um, fear of consequences or just their reputation or they don't want to, you know, they don't want their parents to know or guardians to know. That's not all of them. But the ones that were reported, 7,000 of those involved a minor. And it may surprise you, but 3,000 of those of those resulted in victims, primarily in boys. Um, boys, yeah. A lot of male youth are victims or of sextortion. And, um, you know, they don't, most of the time, they don't know who they're talking to on the, on the other end. This person is, you know, catfishing them or pretending to be someone else. And they are not thinking that this could be a completely different person I'm talking to. And so it is not just an issue for young females. It's also an issue for young males. When it comes to youth um, going through sextortion, we do want to contact local FBI office. We do want to get help before complying. If they haven't complied already, report and block. And remember, it's not your child's fault. So even having conversations before something like this even happens, letting them know like, hey, um, I just want to let you know, because I maybe I came across, I saw this story online, or I saw this in the news, that if this ever happens to you, or if you feel like you're talking to someone and they have bad intentions and they ask you for this, I want you to go ahead and let me know, and I won't get mad at you, but we'll navigate it together because, you know, here's what happened to this person. I don't want this to happen to you like it happened to this other person. So even having conversations about these things before they even come up is important, right? You're going back to that upstream model of prevention. All right, the developing brain. So whether it's gambling or viewing mature content or being a victim of sextortion, the still developing teenage brain can make it that more challenging challenging to navigate these difficult situations in the healthiest and safest ways. So their prefrontal cortex is still under construction, which means planning and decision-making are not developed yet. They're not there. They're under construction. So it's going to take them a while to, to plan ahead, to make those healthy decisions or those positive decisions. Um, and the teen brain is wired to experience feelings stronger than adults, whether it is excitement or pleasure, fear, sadness, or anger, it is felt stronger than when the brain is developed. And when it comes to things like like gambling, you know, receiving a small incentive, that feel-good chemical in the brain that releases the dopamine, right? The feel-good chemical dopamine is highly active and rewards new experiences such as the ones that we mentioned. So it is going to be harder for them to drop those easily or to real or to think like, oh, that was really fun, but it's probably not the best for me. I'm going to go ahead and drop it. No, they're probably going to latch onto it for, for longer and it could turn into an addiction of whatever sort that we when it comes to the behaviors that we mentioned. So it is important to understand that and realize that for when maybe they come to you when it's not too late, you know, maybe they do find themselves in a tricky situation and instead of coming to you earlier, they just really enjoy the dopamine they got from it. And so now they're coming to you when it is a an issue that needs professional help, let's say. Um, we have to think again about the developing brain and how that plays a part into it. And when they are going through these difficult times, we do know that youth turn to substances to cope during times of stress. So 
whatever sort of negative outcomes they're experiencing. Substance use is a common coping mechanism. And we are very concerned about substance use as a coping mechanism because of the rise in fentanyl. So if you don't know what fentanyl is, it is a synthetic opioid that is 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine. We have a couple of images here on the screen. Um, the top left image, you can see it next, uh, fentanyl next to a penny, actually takes a lot less than what we see here to cause someone to overdose. Um, and then at the bottom right here, or when we're comparing the fentanyl pile to the penny, but at the bottom left, a lethal dose you can see on the right, see how few grains of salt or just grains of white dust can cause someone an overdose when it comes to fentanyl compared to heroin. So that goes to show that it is ex extremely potent. It's way stronger than morphine and it's way stronger than heroin. And because of that, it can easily be spread across other street drugs um, without costing them a lot, of, a lot at all. It's really strong and it's cheap to make. And um, it is showing up in other street drugs. It is showing up in counterfeit pills, not just counterfeit opioids, but also counterfeit medications such as Xanax. Um, there is prescription fentanyl, right, that people do use for the most severe type of pain, but illegal fentanyl is what is causing um, youth overdose. And so when it comes to overdoses, um, it's important to know the signs of an overdose because in the United States, 22 adolescents die each week from an overdose and fentanyl is usually a part, is usually uh, a, a substance that caused that overdose. So it is important to be aware, one, that it's out there, um, that it is causing 22 adolescents to die each week, and it's important to recognize the signs. So here we have some signs on the screen, clammy skin, they're going to feel clammy is like like a little sweaty, a little a little moist, um, blue lips and fingertips, unresponsive to verbal commands or questions, deep snoring or gurgling sounds, slowed or faint, slowed or faint heartbeat, and slowed breathing or not breathing at all. Um, so, if you come across someone who is displaying these signs, they're not responding to whether you're kicking them in the feet or you're um, giving their sternum a hard rub. We do want to assume that a overdose is taking place, specifically an opioid overdose, because very much it could be fentanyl. And we can go ahead, and if we have naloxone, aka Narcan, on us, administer that. If someone is having an opioid overdose, um, depending on how much opioid, fentanyl is in their system or opioids are in the system, one dose can wake them up. If you have another dose and they're not waking up, based on the package, you can give them a second dose within a certain amount of time. And it is important to know that it is taking more and more for people to wake up with naloxone. It is a good, it is a good thing to have some with you because of the amount of overdoses that do take place. So you can get them we have naloxone. You can get them from the Substance Use Abuse Coalition Leaders of Arizona and Sonoan Prevention Works. And it's also available for purchase over the counter at most major pharmacies. So it's it's something, just like people were carrying around CPR masks for a while, this is something we should definitely be carrying around. Um, in Arizona alone, four people do die every day from an overdose. I think it might have went up to five. Um, four to five people die every day from an overdose in our state alone. So it is happening it is important to have tools like safety tools like this to be able to help out. And if really good instructions on the box. I got tripped up my own words there. All right, now we're gonna identify risk factors and signs of use. Risk factors for having an unhealthy relationship or an imbalance with the internet. Um, phones at an early age, the earlier they get their phones, the earlier they have access to all the things we talked about unsupervised access to the internet, lack of personal boundaries when it comes to internet usage, and then stress and boredom too. If youth have a lot of free times on their hands and they have access to a smart device, they're going to go to that for, for entertainment. Talk about protective factors, things we can do to 
foster that healthy tech life balance, family engagement, whether it's family engagement when it comes to technology usage or just family engagement in general, when it comes to hobbies, fun things to do, conversations, connection to a positive caring adult, uh, parental disapproval of certain certain apps or certain behaviors online, monitoring behavior in social media. There are softwares out there that make it easier for you to monitor. School involvement, um, of course, not just like when it comes to grades, right? Um, but clubs and sports and extracurricular activities and even just having peers and friends that's on school. And then spirituality. Now we're gonna learn strategies to build resiliency in youth. We want to start early, we like to start early. So it's never too late, never too early or too late to model healthy behaviors. Think about how you use your phone in front of youth or how, think about your relationship with the internet and how is that being, how is your youth seeing that, right? Because if we tell them not to use their phones and then we're on our phones, you are not going to do what we say. Sometimes they're going to do what we do. So um, thinking about our usage and how we can, that family engagement piece, how we can as a family do this together. Create a foundation of sharing and connecting, letting them know ahead of time before anything's even an issue. Like, I want you to know this is a safe space for you to come to me. Even if you think I'm going to get mad, even if you think you're going to be in trouble, I care about your safety first and we're going to get through it together. Let's look for risk factors and respond quickly and effectively. We want to know the facts. So we want to ask questions about technology. We want to do our research online. We want to talk to other adults, share what we share what we learned, and stay informed and follow places like Not My Kid, organizations like Not My Kid. Want to understand the teenage brain. So explain the importance of protecting their, their, their brain development to them. Explain. Explain the science piece to them. Encourage healthy risk-taking. There are a bunch of ways that they can get excitement from taking risks that are linked to healthy behaviors rather than those unhealthy behaviors. Help them find positive activities to achieve the feelings they're seeking. Help them find hobbies that they're passionate about. And maybe, let's say you try to enroll them in a sport like soccer and they weren't about it. That doesn't mean they're not going to like maybe volleyball or they're not going to like badminton or they're not gonna like dance classes so it might take a while for them to find something they enjoy but it is worth letting them try different things if they're not if they're not enjoying the other things that you're offering set clear and firm expectations around technology usage um, we want to take a health and not a punitive approach we want to be clear on disapproval of behaviors and we want to decide on consequences together and follow through when necessary it is important for youth to have voice and to have a choice. And so before, maybe before they get their cell phone or maybe before they download their first social media app, um, letting them know, hey, I'm trusting you with this. And if you happen to break my trust, what do you think the good consequence for you would be? Let them be a part of that conversation and let them join in on deciding their own consequence. That way they can't be surprised when it's time to um, issue that consequence, they can't be surprised when it happens because they were a part of that conversation to begin with. Keep communication lines open. Make sure they know you are there for them, even if they made an unhealthy choice. We want to create a safe and non-judgmental environment to share, and we want to practice listening to them more than talking. Believe it or not, internet usage is a stressor in their life, too. Um, I know a lot of times we go to them when we're bored or, you know, to be entertained, but it's also very much a big stressor for a teenager because of things like cyberbullying or even just social media, um, comparing themselves or viewing all this negative content or having setting expectations on themselves to have more of a presence online or to share the best thing, you know, it is a stressor. So when they talk about how much it stresses them out, instead of thinking like, oh, you don't know what stress is, that's not a stress, that stress is working all day to do this and that, stress is coming home to do this and that, um, listen to them, listen to them because that is the stress that's going on in their life. We want to find ways to connect with them. We want to have conversations that are not always about business. We want to have fun conversations, ask them why they like a certain influencer, ask them why they like a certain app or they enjoy playing a certain video game. We want to share words of encouragement and appreciation. And we want to practice listening more than talking, which is said in the last one. 
create a safety plan, help them practice when, what to do if they run into trouble online. Um, we wanna create a code word to get up to risky situations. And also a code word might be a good idea for, um, for reasons where a deep fake might come up of their voice or of a video. You know, if they're really in trouble, then let agree to a word. Like if you're really in trouble, make sure you say this word because I heard of this situation that came out where a deep fake was used, a youth called a parent, it wasn't real. And I wanna avoid a situation like that. So let's agree on a code word we can use if you're ever really in trouble. That may help prevent um, fraud attempts from deep fakes. And wanna to talk to them about the importance of reporting and sharing um, and not keeping it to themselves. We want to model those desired behaviors. We want to model those behaviors we are asking of them. Remember, they are watching more than they are listening. We want to be human and de demonstrate healthy coping and communication. And we want to take care of ourselves and normalize getting help when needed. Monitor and keeping track. Um, remind them that this comes from a place of loving care. We want to keep an eye on screen time and social media use and spend quality time together and ask questions to be attuned to changes in behaviors. We also wanna use positive reinforcement. So give positive feedback and recognize resilience, celebrate small victories. You feel like there's a lot of expectations placed on them to be perfect or to have the, the best performance in different areas of their life, whether it's uh, grades or athletic performance or any other areas, we want to celebrate the small wins too. And we want to resort, reward desired behaviors that we are seeing and not just focus, give, not just give energy to those um, undesired behaviors. We also want to reward desired behaviors. Maybe if, you know, they kept their screen time down to uh, two hours per day or an hour per day, or they didn't play their video game one day this week, we want to reward that. Give them a little incentive. All right, so how to feel ready to respond to a youth when it is needed. We want to regulate ourselves, the things we're feeling. We want to remain calm. We want to relate to them, imagine ourselves in their shoes, and then we want to respond, right? And when it comes to responding, we want to remember that it's not just about what we say. It's about how we say it, the way in which we say it, and how we are when we say it. So 55% of communication is nonverbal. It is coming from our expressions and our actions, that body language piece. 38% um, is coming from how we say it, and then 7% is actually what we say. And they can read us very well. So we want to make sure that, you know, our, our body matches the things that are coming out of our mouth. Here are some crisis lines that are very important to have handy, just in case you may ever need them. We have Teen Lifeline on here, which... Um, Arizona high schools do have that on the back of their IDs. It's still good for you to know. We have Suicide Prevention Lifeline here in 988. That is national. We have a mental health crisis text line. And then we have the Trevor Project. Here are some additional resources when it comes to internet safety. Specifically, we have, um, there is a monitoring app through Bark, And then you could use Not My Kid to receive a discount. Parenting in a Tech World, that is a Bark Facebook group. Dopamine Nation is a great read by Dr. Anna Lenke. It goes all about just how um, addictive the internet can be. Um, using the internet, how it is hard for us to step away from that. And then there is a technology contract that we do have on our website at notmykid.org. And then if you're looking for a great documentary, the Social Dilemma documentary. Our programs here at Now My Kid, we offer prevention education, just like this adult internet safety presentation. We also go into schools and talk to youth about this topic as well. Um, we offer peer support programs for youth who are needing extra support, that one-on-one -on -one time with the peer mentor to talk about the challenges they're going through and to set goals and to get through those challenges. And we also have behavioral health services um, and all these, all these, all this information about our programs can be found on the Not My Kid website. And you can um, click this QR code, not click it. You can take a picture of this QR code to access that. And there's also our 
website information right there. And I do want to share um, before we end about two upcoming events. They're going to be dropped in the chat box, but we are having a Not My Kids Summer Camp. As we may know, summertime is hard for youth. Um, they're not seeing their peers every day or they're not getting out of the house every day. Maybe they're not, not all of them, right? Some youth are, whether they have summer jobs or they're going on trips or they start hanging out with their friends. But some of you just find themselves at home um, having a lot of downtime to be on the internet. So summer camps are a great opportunity for youth to step outside the house, connect with peers, and engage in offline activities. So we have a summer camp running June 10th through, through June 14th and also June 24th through June 28th, two separate weeks. Um, we're offering an early bird special. There you can find that link in the chat box. And then on May 8th, we are having a Fighting Fentanyl Together forum. And that information is also in the chat box if you would like to attend. And... That concludes today's internet safety presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and look at the chat box and the QA box to see if we have any questions. And I'm gonna to try to figure out how to, oh, here we go. I am not seeing anything come through, but I wanna thank you so much for joining us today for this Internet safety, internet safety presentation. I enjoyed chatting with you all and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.